Savers are losers was coined by Robert Cashflow Kiyosaki back in 1997. And it wasn't received well by the masses, nor when he said the rich don't work for money. If you dismissed rich dad, like so many did as the crazy uncle in your family and continued down the traditional path to financial freedom, I'm, I'm a little concerned for you, especially right now. It doesn't look like it's going to end well. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's go. Hi, my name is Matt Terrio, CEO of Epic Real Estate, where we show people how to invest in real estate so they can escape the daily grind and retire early. Savers are losers, said Robert Kiyosaki. And he wasn't talking about the character of people that save money. He was referring to the money they're losing by saving it due to money no longer being backed by gold as it was prior to 1971. This pivotal event, taking the dollar off the gold standard carried out by President Nixon, gave the government the authority to print money. And they most certainly exercised their authority, especially just in the last year. Money, like anything else, the more there is of it, the less it's worth. And so our money has become worth less ever since. As an example, a $100 suit in 1971 would cost you $674 today. And not because the suit is worth more, but because your dollar is worth less. That's inflation that did that. And typically we see 2% inflation annually, which doesn't seem like much, but accumulated, compounded over that same period, that's an inflation rate of 574%. Imagine the current rate of 5% accumulating and compounding. When seeing numbers like this, most people understand its impact, but it's natural to dismiss immediate action because it feels like, you know, we've got time. It feels like it won't be that bad. It feels like this won't happen to me. Well, let's zoom in from that 50 year period to just this last year. If you put $100 in the bank a year ago and saved it, although your bank account still may show you have $100 in the account, per the consumer price index, its purchasing power is now only worth $95. A $3 bigger loss for you than normal. Now, if that doesn't resonate with you, have you wondered what happened to the $5 foot long at Subway or the $1 menu at McDonald's? Or the fact that Starbucks reported a 20% increase in revenue over the last year, despite a decrease in customer traffic. It's because their $4 latte now costs $5, 25% more. This is where the savers are losers comes from. Your saved dollar buys less. I mean, if you weren't invested in something that earned at least 5% in just the last quarter, you lost. But your 401k, it returned 10% this year. It was a good year. Well, adjusted for inflation, more like 5%. And nobody gets rich today off of a single digit return. Most people just don't make enough to save enough for that math to pan out. And speaking of how much people make, if you didn't receive a 5% salary increase in the last 12 months, you're losing there too. Like your savings rate, your salary must keep up with inflation. But still, as a society, we view saving money as honorable, as it speaks to our, our discipline, our character, and our sense of responsibility. We've gotta let that go. For those who hold on to this sacred cow and stay this antiquated course, it's not gonna end well. The bad news doesn't stop at saving money either. The monetary policy of the day is creating and accelerating these losses for savers also. And here's how. The effective federal funds rate chart shows currently a 0% interest monetary policy, of which directly impacts the interest rates of loans that banks give to their customers. And we know they are at historical lows right now. And it would be hard to walk down the street and find someone that thought low interest rates are a bad thing. But here's why they should be a concern. Interest rates dictate our behavior. When interest rates are low, it makes sense to invest. So investors do, causing asset prices to inflate, making it more difficult for the rest to invest. The more investors invest, the further behind non-investors fall. Salaried employees that don't invest are getting poorer. And this isn't theory either. It's happening right in front of our faces. For example, I took a recent road trip with my son to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And while we were there, at least half the restaurants were closed at the resort. 
But for those that were open, lines wrapped around the buildings. I assumed it was due to COVID or the supplemental federal pandemic employment benefits keeping people at home. But after talking to the guy at the front desk of our hotel, he told me this trend had begun before COVID, citing that it is due to the working class can't afford to live in Jackson Hole. The working force is steadily moving or being pushed away from Jackson Hole for jobs in more affordable cities. I told a friend about this when I got back from our trip and he said, the same thing happening in Lake Tahoe. And it's happening in major metropolitans too, like San Francisco. The chasm between the rich and the working class is getting wider and wider and wider, despite all efforts of the politician of the day to stop it. Or are they trying to stop it? I don't know. Regardless of their intentions, this is the situation. So are you thoroughly depressed yet? <laughs> you don't have to be. There is good news here too. That good news is that you have control over which side of that chasm you end up on. There are actions you can take to save yourself and save your family. A simple first step is just to stop saving as much and start investing more into assets that benefit from inflation, like stocks, commodities, real estate, and other physical and digital assets. That's a good start. It's much better than saving alone. The second step to improve your situation even more would be to invest in income producing assets like a business or cryptocurrency pools or rental property. When Kiyosaki said the rich don't work for money, this is what he meant. He meant their money works for their money. They purchase income producing assets that pays for all of their stuff, that pays for their livelihoods. You see the rich, they focus on cash flow. Cash flow defined is your income less your expenses. Everything is just a math equation. Will this asset make me more than it costs me? Even if I have to use debt to acquire it, even if it's taxed at a higher rate. It's a simple game of just pluses and minuses, but most tend to complicate it because of the labels attached to the minuses. For example, debt is a bad four letter word to most, but to an investor, it's just a minus in the equation. Tax is another one of those bad words, but to an investor, it's just another minus in the equation. Expense is another example of a minus. The objective is to simply have more pluses than you have minuses. A typical scenario might look like this. Let's say you bought a $100,000 rental property. And if this sounds like a unicorn in the woods in today's market, check in with Mercedes at Cashflow Savvy. She's got plenty of them and she's fixed them all up. She's placed tenants in all of them. She's coordinated property management for them and even has financing options already in place. If you're a busy professional and would rather just delegate all of the heavy lifting of investing in real estate to someone else, you can get some free information about this at cashflowsavvy.com. So we have this $100,000 house. We purchase it in a traditional way with 20% down. The bank gives us an $80,000 mortgage, $80,000 of debt. So we'll make principal and interest payments to the bank. And then there are taxes and insurance to pay as well. And we'll say that all amounts to a $650 monthly expense for the property. And it rents for $1,000 a month. That leaves the owner with $350 a month. The difference between the property's income and its expenses. The fact that the part of that expense is comprised of debt and tax doesn't matter to the investor. What's left over does. It's just pluses and minuses. Now, historically, the property's value will increase with inflation and so will the rental income it collects. It's a seemingly small, insignificant step like purchasing one rental property that can keep you on the right side of that growing chasm between the rich and the poor. Make it a goal to do this one simple thing, I don't know, every other year or so, and the wealth you create will be preserved regardless of how high inflation goes. Exchanging time for dollars won't be enough to keep up. Saving money won't be enough. If you're gonna stick to your guns and stay the traditional course, Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, and the, the army of your typical financial planners advocate, understand that it won't end well. So what are your plans to stay ahead of the devaluing dollar and inflating prices? Let me know below. And who else do you know that needs to see this? When their name comes to mind, please share it with them. Oh, and if you've already subscribed, I pulled this video out special for you to watch next. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching, take care.